Today at the National Press Club, the Prime Minister, Kevin Rudd. This is his first press club address since being re-elected leader of the Labor Party. Mr Rudd served as Prime Minister from 2007 to 2010 and was Foreign Minister from 2010 to 2012. Kevin Rudd from the National Press Club in Canberra. Ladies and gentlemen, Welcome to the National Press Club for today's National Australia Bank Address and welcome back to the Prime Minister. As you just heard, this obviously is the first time uh, that uh, Mr Rudd has addressed the Press Club since being uh, re-elected, returned to the leadership of the Labor Party just two weeks ago, a fortnight ago. As we've seen during that, uh, that short period, um, Labor has experienced something of, a, if you like, a reversal in its uh, electoral standing and a revival in the opinion polls as the country prepares for an election sometime later this year. Now, given the considerable public discussion about today's event, I would just like to make the point uh, to our wider audience that the Press Club does traditionally uh, extend a standing invitation, an open invitation to both the Prime Minister and to the Opposition Leader to address the Club uh, whenever and whatever uh, they might choose to do. On this occasion, obviously, Mr Rudd has taken up that invita invitation, so would you please welcome the Prime Minister, Kevin Rudd. Thank you very much, and it's uh, great to be back at the National Press Club of Australia where the great political and policy debates of our nation are so often held. Ladies and gentlemen, I am, without apology, an optimist about our nation's future. Our national strengths are formidable. Our weaknesses, compared with the rest of the world, are few. And if our policy settings are right, the challenges we face for the future are entirely manageable. My optimism, therefore, is not based on some sort of feel-good factor. Instead, it is based on a cold, hard analysis of the facts, including our ability to manage change when change is necessary. And the core fact is this. Australia is seen around the world as one of the strongest economies, one of the most stable societies, as well as a nation underpinned by a robust national security. For these reasons, it's just plain wrong for anybody in our national political debate to be talking Australia down. Of course, there are things that we need to reform. The process of reform, if we are honest about it, is a never-ending process. There's no standing still in this business. But that is different to a daily diatribe of negative politics, whose single objective, it seems to me, is to cause the Australian people to feel that our national economy and our national security is on the verge of falling apart, if not now, than certainly by next Thursday afternoon. Mr Abbott is a formidable politician. He is the most conservative politician to become leader of the Liberal Party in history. He is particularly formidable in the art of negative politics. But a 100% diet of negative politics is bad for our nation, and it's bad for national confidence. And the truth is, it's a bit of a lazy substitute for the hard work that is needed to develop, argue and implement real policies that will change Australia for the better. That is why Mr Abbott has so far stated, and it appears it is now true, that he does not wish to face the public scrutiny of a national economic policy debate here at the Press Club of Australia. Today's debate was to be about the economy. Well, I'll be talking about the economy instead. My core argument today, to you today is that given the new economic challenges that Australia is now facing, what the Australian people now want to see is, is debate about clear, positive economic policy direction for their future. Given the significant and recent decline in our terms of trade, a critical influence on jobs and the living standards of our people, substantive economic policy debate is no longer just an option for our nation, it has now become a necessity, an urgent necessity. Because if we make the wrong decisions now, we'll be living with those decisions for the decade ahead. So how do we best define this core new economic challenge for the nation? And how do we best define the most appropriate policy response to this challenge? When I was first elected leader of the opposition, I argued long and hard that Australia had to prepare for the day when the mining boom would be over. 
You will remember, some of you, that I was ridiculed way back then by Treasurer Peter Costello for even asking the question as if it was some act of uh, economic non-patriotism. The truth is, in 2013, the China resources boom is over. And while the export of resources and commodity volumes are up, the prices we receive for them have now fallen almost 25% since their peak, and they may well fall further. This is reflected in our declining terms of trade from the historic highs we achieved only a year or so ago. At their peak, our terms of trade were more than 60% higher than the average across the 20th century. That is a very big number. Over the course of the boom beginning in 2002-03, these record terms of trade have delivered Australia around a 15% boost in our national income. Our producers have responded fantastically to these international price signals and have brought about arguably the single greatest investment phase in our economic history. But that investment phase is now slowing. Right now we find ourselves at a crossover point for our national economy. A, a transition from an investment intensive phase in our minerals and energy sector, which has understandably pulled resources away from other sectors of the economy, and a tr transition to a new phase of investment in other sectors of the economy, including the traded sector that will now also be advantaged by a lower dollar. Managing this economic transition is now a core task of Australian economic policy, critical for jobs, critical for infrastructure, critical also for national living standards. When I was elected Prime Minister back in 2007, I said the best policy response for any future change in our economic circumstances was to lift our national productivity. I have never changed my view. We then took action by radically increasing investment in human capital, early childhood education, school standards, school infrastructure, school funding, uncapping university places, a radical new investment in economic infrastructure, road, rail, ports, and for the first time, urban transport, and of course, the national broadband network, NBN. And third, a program of regulatory harmonisation between the Commonwealth and the states. Nine months into office, while implementing these productivity-based reforms, we, together with the rest of the world, were hit by the GFC. This was no small thing. This was the largest financial and economic crisis faced by the international economy since the Great Depression three quarters of a century before. We continued to implement our productivity reform agenda, but our core economic priority, understandably, became national economic survival as we watch bank collapses around the world, depositors lose their savings, and economies crash into recession with massive job losses. As you know, here in Australia, we deployed a national economic stimulus strategy, timely, targeted, and temporary, which helped keep Australia out of recession, kept the economy growing, and kept unemployment with a five in front of it, one of the lowest levels in the world. And we did so with lower levels of debt and deficit than practically all the major advanced economies in the world. These were our core preoccupations from 2008 to 2010. In early 2010, with the economy stabilising, as Prime Minister I returned to the theme of national productivity growth. In January 2010, as part of a series of speeches around Australia Day that year, Drawing on the third intergenerational report, Australia to 2050, Future Challenges, I outlined Australia's triple dilemma of an ageing population, static to declining workforce participation rates, and slowing multi-factor productivity growth. Just to recap, in 2010, one in seven Australians were over the age of 65, whereas by 2050, that ratio will fall to one in four. This ageing of the population is also expected to reduce the workforce participation rate from around 65% to 60% by mid-century. And third, average labour productivity growth, which had risen to 2.1% per annum during the 1990s, had fallen to 1.4% in the decade just past, although it has risen to 1.6% over the year too much. Three years later, the three Ps, population, workforce participation and productivity, continue as the core economic agenda for Australia. However, in prosecuting this agenda, we now face the new global and national economic circumstances that I outlined earlier. 
demanding that we implement a new national competitiveness agenda with a new sense of national urgency. These global factors frame the new economic challenge that Australia faces today. How to protect our jobs and living standards, given that global growth is sluggish and now the China resources boom is slowing. I am optimistic that we can rise to this new challenge with a clear-cut policy direction that puts productivity first, driven by a new sense of partnership between government, business and unions. My confidence in rising to this challenge is underpinned by our economic fundamentals, which we have kept strong despite the pressures of the global financial crisis. If anyone seriously doubts this, they should ask why we were one of the few countries in the world to have a triple A credit rating with a stable outlook from the ratings agencies that analyse minutely Australia's and every other country's debt and deficit profile. But strong economic fundamentals are not sufficient in themselves to meet the urgency of the new challenge that now confronts us, productivity growth. The government will maintain a prudent approach to fiscal policy, returning the budget to surplus across the economic cycle, as the Treasurer has recently confirmed. We will continue with our plan to return the budget to balance in the medium term. We will return the budget to balance in 2015-2016. But other economic reforms, what the economists call microeconomic reform, must also be prosecuted with a new urgency. Because the China resources broom is coming off, Australia's core economic strategy for the future must be one which diversifies our economy by creating more jobs in manufacturing, food production, infrastructure, construction and our many other service industries rather than having all our eggs in just one basket, the resources and energy sector. Relying on the lower dollar alone to boost competitiveness is insufficient for the great economic task that lies ahead. That is why Australia must embrace today a new national competitiveness agenda. If we fail to do so, in the years ahead, there is a danger that Australia will begin to price itself out of international business. The core of this new national competitiveness agenda must be a common agreement among us all that we must lift our annual productivity growth rate to 2% or better for the future. This will be hard. It's not easy. Our population should continue to be supported by a strong migration policy designed to mitigate the effects of our ageing population. Our workforce participation policy must continue to embrace positive reforms in paid parental leave, flexible forms of childcare, as well as increased female participation in the workforce in order to keep our participation rate as high as possible. But of the three Ps, our most critical task remains lifting our national productivity growth rate on the back of a new national competitiveness agenda. Over the last two weeks, I've now met on four occasions with the Business Council of Australia and the Australian Council of Trade Unions. I've done so because I have never believed in class warfare. I've done so because I've always believed that Australia at its best is both a nation of equity and of opportunity, a nation that values enterprise because it is enterprise that creates the jobs as well as being a nation, Australia, that values a fair go as well. The truth is, if we are to drive a new national competitiveness agenda, we need to have government, businesses and unions working as much as possible together, pushing in the same strategic policy direction for the overall well-being of our national economy. I do not have a pie-in-the-sky attitude to all of this. There will always be disagreements. That much is normal in any market economy. And we all have a huge interest in growing the size of the national economic pie together. The discussions I have had in the last couple of weeks with both business and unions have been useful in elaborating the possible content of a new national competitiveness agenda for Australia. Thus far, we have agreed on seven broad areas of necessary policy work together. Number one. Domestic electricity price regulation in Australia and the impact of the current carbon price as well as the future availability of competitively priced domestic gas supplies are high on our common agenda. Australian electricity prices are too high by global standards. This affects the competitiveness of all firms. Large
so it affects individual consumers. But before you all start reaching for your revolver on the carbon price, let's be rational about this. The carbon price at present contributes less than 10% to national electricity prices. The primary reason for the hike in electricity prices appears to be the current system of national electricity regulation, which has allowed excessive rates of return for publicly owned transmission and distribution utilities, which have become cash cows for various state and territory governments. Furthermore, reforms are needed for the supply of competitively priced gas for Australian businesses and households. Number two, we must continue to examine any unintended rigidities arising in the labour market. And before anyone gets too excited here, let me record as a fact that under the Fair Work Act, labour productivity in the market sector is running at nearly 2% per annum, one and a half times the pace during the work choices era. Wages growth has been moderate. The wage price index has grown 3.2% through the year. Industrial disputes are low. Under the Fair Work Act, the rate of industrial disputes is around one third of the rate in terms of those days lost under the Howard government. The government believes the Fair Work Act represents a reasonable balance for the future. The government nonetheless believes some businesses are not making the most effective use of this act to drive the productivity outcomes that they need for the future of their firms. What I've discussed with the BCT BCA and the ACTU and Minister Shorten is how we can harness a greater spirit and practice of industrial cooperation to produce better outcomes for us all. Nobody has an interest in a business going bust. We just don't. They employ people with real jobs, real families and with real lives to lead. A good place to start would be in respect of uh, large greenfields projects where large numbers of Australians are employed and which represent significant new levels of investment. These projects reflect to the world the broader industrial, regulatory and investment circumstances existing in the country. We need to make them work and we need to make them work well. Number three, business productivity. The BCA has recently reported on problems in Australian business productivity competent project management, as well as the most effective use of capital by management. The future of the productivity agenda, therefore, does not in any way lie exclusively in the labour market. In fact, some bad industrial outcomes for some major projects can be the result of bad management decisions rather than union hostility. Business might say well, this, is an exclusive, this is exclusively a problem for business itself. I would argue, as does the BCA, that this is also a problem for the nation. I'm also concerned if you went through our business elites, you would not find a whole lot of the top 25 executives in each of our top 100 firms who have spent any of their career time serving in Asia, the engine driver of the global economy through until mid-century. Remember, this is the Asian century. The truth is Australia is much underdone in Asia beyond the resources and energy sector. Indonesia is a classic example, an economy which by 2050 is on track to become the fourth largest economy in the world, after China, India and the United States. But at present, Indonesia does not fall within our top 10 trading partners or our top 20 investment destinations. And last time I looked at the map, they're just next door. A quarter of a billion consumers and an economy growing at 6%. We should be there. This is a problem of Australian enterprise, not a problem created by Australian unions. Number four, we need a new approach to the regulatory impost on business from all levels of government. This particularly applies to multiple and conflicting environmental assessment requirements for state and federal governments. Surely it lies within our wit and wisdom to begin by integrating the assessment procedures and reports at present separately mandated by the Commonwealth and the states. Surely we should aim to have one single integrated assessment system, even if we continue to have two different decision points. An integrated assessment system removes so much of the regulatory burden faced by businesses in getting a project off the ground. I've already discussed this with Premier O'Farrell in New South Wales in particular, and I want to take this discussion further. Number five, education, skills and training. Our national objective must be to build the best educated, best trained, best skilled workforce anywhere in the world. Progress has been made. We now have universal preschool education supervised by teachers for a minimum of 15 hours a week, emphasising pre-literacy and pre-numeracy skills. 
We now have NAPLAN to make publicly transparent the literacy and numeracy performance of all schools in the nation. We never had that before. The government's Better Schools policy plans to invest a further $10 billion over the next six years to lift school standards and education outcomes through transparent, transparent school performance plans. We have uncapped university places for Australian students so that we now have 190,000 more kids at university than we did just five years ago. That is a very big number, translating directly into the quality of the workforce we produce in the future. We do, however, need to do more with vocational education training, particularly given the recent withdrawal of effort by many of the states. Number six, infrastructure. Infrastructure Australia is doing great work. For the first time in the nation's history, a national infrastructure priority list has been developed on the basis of a rigorous cost-benefit analysis. Major projects are underway across road, rail and ports and urban transport. More projects should be underway, such as the Cross River Rail project in my home city of Brisbane. The NBN is being rolled out, the new infrastructure of the 21st century, which of itself becomes a massive productivity driver for firms. We do, however, need to embrace new forms of infrastructure financing, and this forms part of an important ag agenda for work. And number seven, we must improve the operating environment for small business in Australia. We want to work with the Council of Small Business of Australia on this. This involves access to capital. It also involves other productivity drivers, such as the effective take-up of the NBN. As Prime Minister, I am passionate about the future of small business. During the course of the next week, key cabinet ministers will sit down again with the BCA and business groups and with the ACTU to hammer out agendas of work in these critical areas, COSBOA in the case of small businesses, to work out where to go next with each of these critical agenda items. I say again as Prime Minister, I want to bring the nation together in this new national competitiveness agenda. It's the only way it's going to work. I've outlined the government's definition of Australia's core economic challenge to manage the economic transition that lies ahead by maintaining macroeconomic stability and at the same time implementing a new national competitiveness agenda. You might well ask, at least in his absence, what Mr Abbott's alternative economic diagnosis is. And based on that diagnosis, what his alternative policy prescription for the national economy is. Mr Abbott says that Australia's core economic problem is that we are suffering from a debt and deficit crisis. He said in his budget reply of 2013, there is now a budget emergency. Mr Abbott is a formidable politician. He is the nation's most formidable exponent of negative politics. And negative politics, above all, is designed to induce feelings of worry, of anxiety and fear in the community. He and the Liberal Party have concluded that fear is a far better political bet than engaging in a debate on the facts. Which is why, once again, Mr Abbott appears to be absent from our debate today on the economic facts of the nation. So here's a few facts. Fact one, over to my right, you will see uh, this illustrated by a graph. Uh, I was going to use 27 graphs today, uh, but I was restrained by my staff in, <laughs> in case any of the ladies and gentlemen of the press were perhaps to accuse me of excessive programmatic specificity. <laughs> Fact one, despite Mr Abbott saying every day the economy is in crisis, since we've been in office the Australian economy has in fact grown by 14 per cent, whereas over the same period of time the economies of the UK, France and Germany have actually shrunk in size. Uh, UK, France and Japan have actually shrunk in size. And those of Germany and the United States have only grown about one-fifth the rate of the Australian economy, while Canada has grown by around half our rate. Not a bad report card. Fact two, Australia has one of the, to my left, one of the lowest levels of government debt as a percentage of our economy in the OECD. Fact three, Australian government debt per capita is one of the lowest in the OECD. Fact four, Australia's budget deficit as a proportion of the size of our economy is also one of the lowest in the OECD. And, fact five, Australia's unemployment rate is lower than almost every major advanced economy. It's gone up to 5.7 today. This is a challenge and it underlines the absolute paramount importance of prosecuting the new national competitiveness agenda that I've outlined earlier in my remarks. 
So this is the factual economic report card for Australia that Mr Abbott does not want to debate today. Let's go to debt and deficit levels in particular, because this is what Mr Abbott has banged on about for three years now, and it will dominate Mr Abbott's negative message for the election campaign. Our debt level is scheduled to peak at 11.4% of the size of our economy. Of course, we should always be concerned if we have a debt, and we should always repay our debts responsibly. But Australia does have one of the lowest debt levels in the world. Because Mr Abbott's exaggerated claims on debt and deficit are based on a falsehood, the whole house of cards he has constructed against the government's economic credentials, resting on his flimsy foundation of debt and deficit attack, comes tumbling down. Mr Abbott's economic policy for the future, frankly, is a little bit worse. His prescription is to implement a slash and burn austerity drive across the nation. Well, we can see how that works already. Go to my home state of Queensland under Campbell Newman, where business and consumer confidence has been shaken by the sacking of thousands of people and the shrinking of critical government services. And I note for a fact today that the unemployment rate in Queensland has gone up to 6.4%. In fact, it's now the highest unemployment rate in mainland Australia, and it has gone up from something in the order of 5.4 or 5.5% when Mr Newman first became Premier. What state governments do can have an impact on the real economy and look no further than Queensland for the case in point. We've also seen the impact of austerity drives by Conservative governments in the United Kingdom, which nearly produced a double dip recession and has continued to plague growth. Just this year, the UK recorded the largest quarterly decline in household living standards in a generation. And please note this core fact once again, the British economy today is smaller than it was back in 2008. In summary, regrettably, it seems Mr Abbott just doesn't understand economics. And don't take my word for it, that's exactly what former Treasurer Peter Costello had to say about Mr Abbott. To conclude, today I wanted to debate the future of our national economy. Mr Abbott's absence has made such a debate impossible. Therefore, whenever you hear Mr Abbott, Mr Hockey, Mr Robb or anyone else try to run the lines of an Australian debt and deficit crisis, remember this was the day for Mr Abbott to defend his case. Instead, Mr Abbott has decided to cut and run from this debate. Run away from the facts, but keep pumping out the fear. In Mr Abbott's absence, what I have done today is outline our framework, the Australian Government's framework, for tackling Australia's future economic challenges. Australia is now an economy in transition, a transition from the previous decade of the China resources boom to the decade ahead where we must now diversify our economy so that we don't have all our eggs in one basket. The challenge for the Australian Government is to accelerate a new national competitiveness agenda that boosts our long-term productivity growth. And we need to aim for a productivity number with a two in front of it. And to get there, we need to bring the nation together, not pull the nation apart. Australian Labor governments know how to manage the great transitions in our economy. We did it with the Hawke and Keating governments when they transitioned Australia from the old, closed, post-war economy to the new internationalised economy that set us up for the future, producing 22 years of sustained economic growth and an underlying inflation rate of 2.5 per cent. That's a world record. And we did it again under this government when we transitioned Australia through what Paul Keating recently and eloquently described to me as the valley of death of the 2008-2009 Great Global Recession. And I believe we can transition Australia again, capturing the gains of the Asian century while diversifying the Australian economy so that in the future we have all sectors, all our cities and our regional centres lifting their economic performance. Australian Labor governments manage transitions. We sketch the future. We harness the energy and the ambition of our people. And as the people's government, we put policy to work to put the changes in place that best secure our future. I thank you.